I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled today are Dennis McNeil and artist Patrick Hughes. Tenor Dennis McNeil was born and raised in Los Angeles. He's a fourth generation Californian, and he lives in the South Bay with his wife and his daughters. After graduating from Loyola High School, he went to University of California at Davis to earn a degree in economics. What were you doing there? You oh, weren't there's singing. A story behind that. <laughs> really? Weren't you interested in music at that time? Not at all. So this whole musical career, the opera, the Broadway stage, the uh, masses, the liturgy, everything has come since you were in college? It all, uh, yeah, yeah. How Second year it, in college. What? Tell us what happened, because it's amazing. Well, there was a girl. Oh, <laughs> Isn't that how every story starts? Um, I was uh, encouraged to take this um, music class by her that she was taking, and it was a class that if you had no musical background whatsoever or any musical training, that you still could um, survive. And I still have the book to this day that uh, basically shows you where this note is and where it is on the piano and just, you know, really? learning from scratch. Is that how you learned, really? Yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing led to another, and uh, you know, a couple of years later, I was a music minor, and to be a music minor, you had to have performance, which I almost didn't become a minor because I saw that in the catalog, and I decided to go in and talk to somebody about it, and they said, "Well, can you sing?" And I said, "I don't know, maybe with a radio." At that point, you still didn't oh, know no. you had a voice, no. Dennis. I was 20. Wow. Yeah, and so he said, "Well, why don't you go in and talk to the choir director?" And I went in and uh, he said, well, what, do you, what would you like to sing? And I said, sing? <laughs> By myself? You mean right here, right now? And he, he said, yeah. I said, well, I, I don't really know any songs. And he said, well, how about Happy Birthday? Is so right? how many people know Happy Birthday? We all know Happy Birthday. So I sang Happy Birthday in about seven different keys until he figured out that I was a bass. Now, I'm not a bass anymore, but um, I think he decided that I was a bass because he could use a bass and oh, definitely okay, didn't did. need a tenor or a baritone. And did you sing that bass part for he, him he, uh, or he, in his chorus? Uh, in the chorus, yeah. 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 And then, you know, one thing led to another and I tried out for solos and got those and slowly but surely got in, into it. In 1984, for your senior project, you did this huge Olympic coordination. I don't know what you would call it. Well, it wasn't a senior project. There was uh, two different things. But uh, when I graduated from, from Davis, I went to work for the LA Olympics. Oh, that's what it was. And I worked for Tommy Walker and David Wolper and uh, was a production supervisor for all the rehearsals. Oh, for everyone else's? Oh, I thought you yeah. had to put it all together well, and I was, write it. Uh, no, I didn't do any of the writing, but oh, I did I all the coordination. I put together a thousand voice chorus. It was so great. I was 350 there. 350 break dancers. In the. Uh, Coliseum, oh. Los Angeles Coliseum. It was fabulous. And then after you finished that project, you went back to the Institute of American Musical. I've never heard of it. The Institute for, for, the, um, for the American, actually, that was the title at the time. It, was, it started out as a musical theater workshop. That's what I would think you yeah. would go to. I and saw, I didn't understand then they, that. For a while, changed it to the Institute for the American Musical. I oh. think it's back to being the musical theater workshop. That sounds better. And it's you also worked at the San Francisco Opera at the same time? You that was later, but yeah. When I mean, when you came, when you finished Davis and you decided you wanted to sing? Exactly, yeah. Those are some of the training programs that I did. The Marilla Opera Program at uh, San Francisco. And, um, Did you have to train a long time? <clears throat> I mean, you must have had this God-given gift and you never knew it. My mom supposedly knew. <laughs> <laughs> but she forgot to tell you? No, she told me too much. <laughs> oh, she was pushing you all the time? A well, a little bit. She would say, oh, you have such a good ear. You, you have such a pretty voice. Why don't oh. you sing in the chorus? Why don't you sing in the choir? Why don't you, you know? Oh, she and did. I always would say, oh, but that's, that's gay, mom. But moms know best, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she she definitely knew best. So you ended up with an opera debut in 19, what, 88? Uh, around that time? Sometime around there, and depending on, on which company. You were you had a role in Los Angeles. What right. role was that? Uh, the role of Ferrando in uh, Cosi Fantute with the L L.A. Opera. Well, how did you learn these all these parts? I mean, well, you, you just... You just Study, 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 memorize, you know, and you pound out notes, listen to various recordings. 
Uh, that's sort of the wonderful part about opera mm -hmm. is that uh, unlike a play or other genres is that in opera uh, there are a lot of recordings of all kinds of different people interpreting the that's, same role. That's interesting. You know, there's, there's only two or three versions of say Carousel right. or Oklahoma, right. uh, be it the, um, the ultimate versions with my good friend John Raitt. But um, the, the great thing about opera is that you could go and you could listen to Pavarotti and then Domingo oh, and see. then Carreras and then you could go back in time and listen to Caruso or UC Burling and, so and that really learn how they you. each interpret and they all interpret their uh, own with their own little style. I see. That's a, well, that's an interesting point I never thought about. 1990 yeah. at San Francisco, uh, you were with the San Francisco Opera. Right. And right. what was that? Uh, well, and that was sort of coming right out of that training program. Um, oh, they asked me to come and I did the role of Eisenstein in uh, Deflator Mouse, which is a fun, fun role. Lots of comical So something you moments. had to learn again. Oh, yeah. Did you have to take acting lessons so that you knew how to... W yeah, I did a lot of acting, uh, a lot of studying in, in the acting uh, side of things. In fact, I always thought of myself when I was on stage as a as a theatrical performer in opera and, and Broadway type musicals, um, I always people would say, "What do you do for a living?" And I would say, "I'm an actor." Before I would say, "I'm a oh, singer." I would always identify myself mm. first as an actor uh, for that reason. That Be because I, I I think that the idea of bringing a character to life is what acting is all about, and that the music. But is is put on top of that, as opposed to the other way around. But more with the music. It, you always think of the music, and then you think that that person has to go along with the music. That's right. That's so right. You also were New York City, New York. Uh, At the New York City Opera. New York City Opera right. in 1992. Right. And right. what did you sing there? Uh, I made my debut there in the role of Don Jose in Carmen. Oh, and, and then you took two national tours of Carmen. I, I had already done one, which was great, because oh. with the San Francisco Opera, they have a touring company called the Western Opera Theater. Oh. And um, I toured with them and uh, then decided to move to New York, which is what every opera singer eventually needs to do right. before they move to Europe, which I did also. But um, uh, what happened was once I had moved back there, I found out that the the New York City Opera was also doing a tour of Carmen so I had auditioned oh, for it oh. and I'd already been hired for that role and I got a call one morning uh, from at the time the artistic administrator Donald Hazard said um, how far along are you in learning the part of Don Jose and I said oh I already know it oh. he said would you be able to do it tonight is that right yeah and, and you just got there <laughs> that's right I mean this is I'd really been in New York maybe two weeks and uh, it's kind of one of those, you know, main Hollywood perfect, kind of perfect right. stories. Perfect. And um, I said, sure. He said, well, can you come in? And, and we, we discussed the situation because their tenor was sick. He was still going on, but they weren't sure whether he was going to make it. So I watched the entire opera from the uh, wings. I'd spent the entire day rehearsing it and learning all the steps and all the m moves for what, what they do in this production. And uh, watched this poor tenor struggle through it. And just before the fourth act, uh, the, um, he, the artistic administrator came back to the artist's viewing room where we watch in the back and said, would you be able to finish this, <gasps> the opera? And um, I said, sure. And he says, come on. And we went backstage. Oh they were about gosh. to hold the curtain and put me in. They decided, no, we're going to go ahead and let this guy finish. So I uh. didn't finish it, but I went on then for the rest of the run. Uh, that Saturday, made, making my debut that this week. This is uh, the Magic Flute. Right, that was also at New York City well, Opera. That was also at New York City Opera. Yeah. Um, and you didn't stay rooted. Well, you you won a, a big, a lot of awards, opera awards. You uh, from the Metropolitan Opera auditions, the right. national auditions, and you went from California to New York. You had a lot of awards, but you didn't stay rooted in opera. No. No, and actually. Why was that? You well, went on broad. You did Broadway shows. No, I wasn't on Broadway. I did, did Broadway, Broadway shows, shows in regional theaters. Yeah, Carousel. The you did. Uh, I'm gonna put this down and show this one because this is Zorba, with John Ray. Right. And it's, how did you decide to do that? Well, actually, uh, in my preparing to become an opera singer, I also did a lot of studying, like I said, about with acting. But I also did a lot of, you know, worked on a lot of musicals and uh, you know just learning the roles or learning parts and learning songs and um, 
I actually fell in love with that music in a way more than opera. And because I was such a late bloomer, I didn't have any particular allegiance to any particular uh, genre. Well, so it was, it was, to me, just a natural flow. I want to be, our, our time just goes so fast. <laughs> uh, but one of the things you've made, um, I don't know how many CDs. Six, yeah. Oh, so you'll tell me. <laughs> you've made, um, you're known in Los Angeles as the great national treasure of being an Irish tenor. I, I am. <laughs> you are, yes. I think you're like the national treasure of Los Angeles. But you did Celtic Fire and uh, what was the other Irish? Forever Irish. Forever right, Irish. Right, those are two CDs. And the first time I met you was always at these Irish affairs. That's right. So, but you do sing other things. You you sing liturgical music, Ave right. Maria. I have uh, 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 this recording, Ave Maria, which uh, is all, uh, it's very classically rooted, but it's it's um, orchestral arrangements of, of um, some of the classical sacred songs. You also have done two Christmas albums. Right, I which just I'm finished one that's just out, yeah, called so It's Christmas. I'm sure, is this the one? That's it's the Christmas. one. But I'm sure with the Christmas that they just, you use them every year, year after year after year. That's what I find is that people come back to me and they tell me, oh, we just finished wrapping all our presents and you were playing all day, yeah. you know, which is, which is kind of neat. The other thing is requests. Right. Uh, what's in that? That's a very, um, sort of covers a broad spectrum of things, but it's, it's a lot of the music that I sing the most. Things oh, from The Impossible request. Dream. Request. Exactly. <laughs> oh, uh, except for Danny Boy's not on there because it's on the other two. Uh, but it's got um, Conte Partiro, the Bocelli song. Oh, you've mixed O Sole everything? Mio. Uh, a couple of Irish songs, one oh. called The Town I Love So Well, oh. but then uh, things from Les Mis, Phantom. Oh, uh, so that's fabulous. Yeah, so it's a little bit of Broadway, a little bit of Italy, a little bit of Ireland. Fabulous. Yeah. And quickly before we go, I know you were on uh, the on the road with uh, Sammy Khan. Right. He's so, he was so fabulous. You must have had a great time it doing was, that. It was incredible. What did you do with him? Well, we were on the road for six months. Uh, we did, um, we were at the Marines Memorial in San Francisco. Well, what did you do? Well, they, basically, he did a, a, a montage or a, a Then I Wrote kind of a, a uh -huh, show right. talking about all the songs he wrote. And um, there were three of us that would go with him. And he would tell the stories and sing some of the songs, but then he would walk oh. off and then we would take over. I sang some of the Sinatra tunes, Three oh. Coins in a Fountain. Is that and, right? But then especially the reason I was hired was to sing the two Mario Lanza hits, Be My Love and, uh, and Because wrote, of Mine. He wrote all He wrote all both that. of those with uh, Nicholas Brodsky. Oh, so you were the perfect Mario Lanza. Well, tonight. I don't know about the perfect, but it was great. It was <laughs> oh, a lot of fun. I thought Sammy Khan was great. Oh, he was a And treasure. you know, I flew home from San Francisco one day, and he was on the plane. He said he had just been performing, and I bet it was Maybe that. Could have been, because we were in Atlantic City as well, and, and at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Oh, you oh, that's great. Yeah, oh. and uh, actually, there's one of the, the tracks on the It's Christmas, is uh, his two Christmas songs, Let It Snow, and uh, Christmas Waltz, a wonderful medley, and I was so glad that I could put that on and sort of pay tribute to my friend. He really was. And you can get them all on my website, DennisMcNeil.com. <laughs> <laughs> terrific uh, writer. Dennis, thank, thank you. you for being with us today. Thank we you. We really I'm enjoyed it. Delighted. Uh, don't go away because we're going to be back with artist Patrick Hughes. We have a catalog of his. We're going to show you some of his work, and we're going to ask him how he actually made this painting that's on the set or this paper piece that's on the set. So we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back. Artist Patrick Hughes was born and raised in Birmingham, England in 1939. By the time he was 17, he left home for London and kind of a menial job on Maddox, Maddox Street, where he was surrounded by art galleries. This early part of his life was obviously an influence of things to come. And in around 1958, he left London and went to Leeds. At that point, Patrick, I think you wanted to be a writer. 
Yeah, I went to a training college for teachers and they said, tell us which uh, writers you like. And I said, I love uh, all the absurd writers. I love Lewis Carroll and Eugenie Inesco who wrote The Chairs and The Ball right. Prima Donna. And I love Franz Kafka. And they said, you best do art. Because they had the <laughs> idea, writing was the Brontes, was all the great Dickens, all the great 19th century novelists. And they thought that uh, humor, which is really my genre, was uh, something that could be in art, but couldn't really be in writing. But they changed your path then. They changed your career path. <laughs> well, I did as I was told. It was one of the rare occasions <laughs> when I did as I was told. And I've been, um, I've pursued it ever since. It was good though, in a way, it was a bit like uh, Mr. McNeil was saying, you know, when, it's not too late to change. He was 20 when he became a singer. I was um, 19 when I became an artist. It, it seems oh, young to us now, doesn't it? At yes. the time, we might have thought we would have started earlier, but it was, it was soon enough. So you never, the, the point is, you didn't want to be an artist all your life. I think no. that's what happens in so many situations. People go, oh, I always wanted to do this all my life. But yeah. it's interesting when you start at a point where you're knowledgeable enough to know what you want to do. Yeah, I knew what I wanted to say. I but you have to, to say, have the talent to be able to say that. Yeah, but uh, also I think you have to be foolish enough. You know, people sometimes say to me about my work, well, it's so clever. Uh, to which, uh, and it appears perhaps superficially to pe people to be clever because it's geometric or measured. But I say, well, no, in a way it's foolish. You know, I made it all the wrong way round. To get it, to where you're going. You know, so it's, it, it's not necessarily to be... Uh, to be so clever, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. That's right, and that's why you were able to do it. But you're reading the background of your reading that you wanted to do, and and as you say, your offbeat uh, uh, was more surreal, and you were influenced by the surrealists, I think. Oh, deeply influenced by the surrealists. Yes, I still am. I think I love the surrealists. I really. Uh, my own dad died when I was quite young in my 20s, but uh, Magritte is really my dad. You can kind of choose a father, and I, I chose the great René Magritte, I think. When you started, um, as you say, you were told to, to do art, to make art. Did you think of combining words from what you were writing or thinking about and the art together? No, I didn't. I really, thought, I really think it's wrong in a way to have words with uh, pictures. Ah. I think that it's a specially different thing. I don't, there are artists who have words in their pictures, like, uh, I don't know, Ron Kitai or somebody, but I don't have any words. I, there's no words on the picture. That's interesting. I thought maybe that the words that you had read would be part of that influence along with the surrealist readings. I think idea, it's ideas, isn't it? We have ideas in our heads and we might, we might enunciate them in words or in uh, music or in pictures. But I in back of the words or I, uh, pictures are the ideas. Uh, in 1964, when you were teaching at Leeds College, you came in contact with Richard Hamilton. And I think that combination or that contact made art history in London. What was that? Well, it was really, there was a third person who was there, was uh, Richard Hamilton's um, dad, if you like, uh, Marcel Duchamp, the most important <laughs> artist of the, t of the 20th century, everybody thinks now, so was you had Marcel Magritte, Duchamp. You had Magritte and Hamilton had Duchamp? Yeah, he oh, that was pretty Duchamp. cool for these two English guys. <laughs> yeah, and he had, he had, uh, he was making in, uh, up in Newcastle, he was making under the influence and uh, supervision of Duchamp, he was making the large glass, which hangs in the Tate Gallery now. You remember it broke in the 1920s, right. and it is in fact in uh, Washington, D.C., the first great broken one. But uh, Hamilton wanted to remake it fresh. But didn't you get together with a bunch of artists and do a show at the ICA? Yeah, we did. We had, uh, well, there was a lot of um, ICA work then, and it, it, it goes on but in a different way. Yeah, I was a part of a, I wasn't I part who. of the independent group. Uh, pop art, in a way, started at the ICA with uh, Paolozzi and Hamilton and Blake and uh, <coughs> Paul Field, me, Patrick. The 
But I came in a, a rather later wave, but it was still there, that spirit. Um, and then from Leeds, which is what, north? Yeah. North. Uh, north. <laughs> you came back to London, I guess. Yeah, I came to London. And yeah, everybody you has to go to London. <laughs> to go, go back to London. Um, and you started doing what people looked at as three-dimensional work. How do you describe your work? Um, well, I've described it in various uh, puns. It relates uh, th this book is called. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. Uh, this book is called Perversespective. Instead of being called Perspective, I call it Perversespective. In so, the sense, it's the wrong way round. So is, this is would be inspired by Magritte, I would think. Oh yeah. It, well, Magritte is one of those artists who's made clouds his own. You know, clouds. <laughs> <laughs> Clouds come over Los Angeles every day, but they're all signed Magritte. And if you see them through a window or through a door, that's right. Um, but also, geometry played a big part, p plays a big part in your work. How does that happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a simple sort of geometry. In, in, in a picture like this, I, I kind of force is this into the same the type world. of thing we can yeah, show Yeah, in this? the libraries, I, I kind of force the libraries into a very simple geometry. It's like kind of forcing your, your foot, uh -huh. which is an organic thing, into your shoe, which is a, a, a mechanically made thing, isn't it? And I, I somehow force um, the whole world, as you'd see in, in my show at um, Flowers West at uh, Bergamot Station, I force everything into this very simple geometry. But does it, but it looks like it moves. It does, yeah. And, and how do you achieve that? Here's another, I think, lovely, inspired, surrealistic, inspired piece. The present, yeah. Yeah. Well, the answer to that is, that, Joan, I don't uh, make it move. You make it move. The, be the beauty of my system is that it just hangs on the wall, uh -huh. and the people walk up and down, and then in their heads, the people who are looking at it create the sense of movement. So I don't actually have to do anything except make it in perspective. With a piece like this, which is ex sticking away from the, the background, let's say, um, you use molds because I, saw, I see these molds. How do you do them and how does it work, actually? Well, you just, um, how does it work? It's do you always use a mold? No, uh, yeah, or it's not a mold so much as a, um, as a, a shape, a manufactured uh, shape I glued see. together. I see, I see. But the way it works is um, it's as if it was a flat picture. Say it was in a, a Walt Disney cartoons, a flat picture, and I sort of tweak it out, I pull it out. What I've done is, uh, um, say, when we're being seen now on the television, it could be, I suppose, in 3D, couldn't it? Uh -huh. Imagine if you and I stuck out of the television, out of that flat uh, right, screen out we're of the appearing flat, on. Yeah. The so I, I, uh, I stick out, I stick everything out. And as a result, the viewers and so on sort of make it go back in. One of the interesting things, I think, um, art historians or art people talk about science and art. And it's a, it's a big difference. Some people think that art is not science and some people think uh, that you shouldn't have any, that art shouldn't be associated. And yet because of the, I don't know, the geometry of what you do or the way you talk about putting these things together, you've had shows in science museums. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm which is a really interesting type of uh, thing. Yeah, I've always be, been um, uh, interested in science, and the uh, Martin Gardner's famous column in the Scientific American of mathematical games was an influence on me. And I think that um, I have some perceptual psychologists, uh, most usually people I speak to, and I speak to universities, and they do papers on my work, and I'm interested in. Uh, uh, psychologists are interested in the way in which we see with the world, which is an extraordinary uh, system of computing, shall we say, that the brain does. But you, uh, you put it on the wall and you make it into art, where they're reading it in the book. Yeah. I mean, you're doing a different thing that they probably couldn't do. 
the no, scientists. No, I can, I've sort of uh, invented an illusion, uh -huh. um, but they're very interested to study it and say, well, why, I don't really know why it works, John. Yeah. <laughs> and, <they're> oh. <laughs> very, <laughs> and they want to know, and they have ideas of why does it do all this stuff. Yeah, well, that's the interesting part of it. It is. In, I, I am interested, but I don't have an answer. And uh, I'm not sure if they do, but they like looking for that answer. So when somebody says um, Patrick Hughes, what do you think of? What should we think of? I'd like to think of somebody who's trying to um, invent something that would um, um, bamboozle you or, uh, or, or make you see things differently. I'd like to think when you've been to see one of my pieces, you'd come out and see all these corners and all these boxes and all these shapes. Um, a fresh and a new. I think that's what happens. And just before we leave, I know you've said that you're not um, an artist artist. No, I don't, think, I don't think I am. I'm not sure why. I think it's, um, it's too finished or too clear cut or too, it doesn't leave enough room for... Oh, for, uh, you to, for the growth? Yeah, for, it doesn't leave enough um, this has not got the blurred enough edges, I think, for <laughs> artists. I finished them off. Oh, there's I a, see what you're saying. There's a way of, uh, some, uh, my criticism of me is that instead of finishing them, I finish them off. I see, I see, I see. <laughs> and in the, in the meantime, Patrick Hughes has been really actually bridging the gap, I think, between art and, and science. I never looked at it that way. Yeah, but, that's uh, a good way of putting it. That, that's, uh, what you're doing today, you're teaching us a new way to look at things, and I thank you. I thank, thank you for being with us, and your work can be seen at Flowers West. We have it on the end roll. And I thank all of you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Please keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 917, and we'll answer any questions you have. See you next time. Bye. Thank you.